welcome. I'm here today to tell you about escaping the labyrinth and what it is and how you can get out of it. Do you remember any of these websites? Yeah. Yeah. Some of them uh, are not with us today anymore. Some of them have been cast into the bottom of the stench, especially in MySpace. Uh, um, but the difference between how a site dies when it gets cast in the bottom of the front of stench is whether you can get your data back out or not. Okay. The data about hometown was a two week time period for anybody knew that all the data would be removed. AOL Hometown. A lot of people had their website on AOL Hometown, but no one got an email who was signed up for AOL Hometown when AOL Hometown was actually removing all the data off, off of the sites. Instead, on the homepage, not on AOL.com, on the AOL Hometown homepage, there was a small post that said, we're going to remove all of your data all of your sites. Sorry, we're trying to No one got it. People were putting up memorial pages for lost, uh, for lost kids. Um, uh, happy birthday pages, family picture pages, and all of these were there. Because these were sites for people that didn't necessarily want to learn how to code from scratch. They didn't own any of that data. Versus Phosphorus, when Phosphorus was shut down, it was very simple. Phosphorus said, you can't have your data, here's an export for you. This is a much more reasonable way of allowing people to export the data off the site. This is an example of a, of a screenshot of uh, an AOL thread after people realized that AOL hometown had shut down all their sites. My favorite one is, what a shambles and a poor show. Fortunately, I saved my webpage and transferred it to GeoCities. <laughs> <laughs> AOL, instead of opening back up the data and allowing people to export their websites, just closed the comment thread and said, sorry, no more comments. <laughs> so, lesson learned, I guess. Social networking has a very simple proposition. <laughs> you get a free social networking site. You can contact your friends in a much more efficient way than just with mail. You don't have to build your own website or have your own domain name or know how to blog. All you have to do is press buttons and have a social status update and fill in the blanks and have a template itself online. And so people really love this usually. It seems very nice, it seems very shiny. Look into this crystal ball and you will see your dreams. And it looks okay from the outside. In fact, uh, it might be slightly daunting, but not as daunting as setting up your own domain name or understanding what DNS is. But when you get further and further inside it, you realize that you're pretty much stuck and you don't know your way out and you don't own your data anymore. So, welcome to the labyrinth. Countless people throughout history have been stuck in this. Uh, well, throughout at least the last few generations. So we're all stuck in this labyrinth. And if you want to look more about what this is, you can go to indiewebcamp.com slash silo and read about silos. Um, and that means we're beholden to changing user interfaces. The idea of having somebody else own your, own, own your website, own your user interface, means that you can have whatever you want on Twitter or Facebook and you have this great user interface that you really enjoy. But then somebody who you don't know can go around and just change the interface on you and then you don't want to get there. Or loss of access to data. Randomly, your profile could be considered a, a violation of the terms of service. And so it could be taken down. You don't have access to data at all. Or surveillance. Because everything's on the same servers, it's very easy to query and easy to sell this data. The first form of surveillance is simply, let's have your data so that we can serve you better ads. The second form of surveillance is, the NSA thinks because you said something that matched this keyword in our system, and if you want to see how far that can go, just watch the movie Brazil. Um, <laughs> and so you should be on this list. Um, my friend Ralph Houston said, we invest a bunch of our lives in these kind of virtual condos, and any time something go in and do what they want with them because we don't own them. Um, I, think of, I think of a digital space for your stuff online to be a kind of house. Your house you put physical items into, and online you put all these digital items into this place. It's 
pretty much the same thing. But if somebody goes in, can you, can you imagine in your physical house somebody saying, hey, we're going to do updates to your house. In fact, we're going to move all these cabinets in other places, and we're going to move the door, and we're going to shorten the length of the lawn, and then we're going to decorate it differently. And if they're really nice, they'll let you see a preview of what your house might look like <laughs> for two weeks before they switch your entire house over to them. That's what I feel like when I get a preview of what it's going to be when somebody's changing the website. The issue is often when a website is redesigned, not all of the website is redesigned. There are a lot of different edge cases that aren't completely filled out. And so you find yourself trying to open your cupboard and get the glasses that you thought you had, but you can't get them anymore because they don't exist and the cupboard door doesn't exist anymore because it got moved. And when you ask somebody about it and support, that support ticket doesn't really go anywhere and you have this complete uncertainty. So your identity in the labyrinth it's kind of like a Maslow's hierarchy. You know? Throughout time, we've had certain um, physiological needs and safety needs fulfilled by ourselves. You would go through a, um, you would go through a cave, and you would make a cave your own, and eventually you might plant crops, and eventually, um, eventually you'd have your own tribe, and you would build your own tribe of people, um, and then you might get self-actualization through that. But now, we rent a house, we go to a supermarket, it's kind of a subscription model for our food, and we don't grow our own food anymore. And now we have our own template itself on Facebook. So all the way up to Maslow's hierarchy, our self-actualization is provided by a third-party service. <laughs> so something happened in 2003 that changed a lot of this. So the question is, what actually happened in 2003? Well, if we go back to 1997 and 2002, we had a lot of people having jobs. People were known for their domain name. People were known for running their own blog. And, and actually, at um, early South by Southwest multimedia instead of interactive, you could go and everybody had these name badges that said, here's my domain name. So you could know who, some, who somebody was. People were learning how to program and doing web development through running their own blogs and sites. And the blogs and sites didn't even look that good. In fact, they looked very bad. And that was OK. Everyone could make a bad looking website. Compared to today, where if you want to make a website, you've got like, three different browsers to test for it, a bunch of different browser versions. Um, you have to be compliant with all these random web standards, and then you have to use a framework, and then you have to make it all shiny because websites now are not made by individuals as much as they are made by a team of 30 people of venture capital. And so that really raises the bar for people to independently make their own website because they get intimidated. They say, well, why? Why doesn't it look like this? Um, RSS and ad rule, so you can subscribe to some of these websites through RSS and ad feeds. And WordPress point six came out, which was really interesting. The first time you had, oh, well, it's a kind of buggy framework, but you can install on your own server. This eventually moved to a one click model where you could just install. There were some plugins, there were some templates, and somebody could participate in WordPress at various different levels. You didn't have to know how to code to be able to install it and log. But if you wanted to change something, you could make your own theme or your own plugin. So everybody could participate in, in this level. Um, and then, of course, the URLs. This is from uh, 2003 South by Southwest with the guy who uh, founded WordPress. So, what happened in 2003 was the thing that RSS and Adam Wars, where a lot of really smart people decided not to keep moving the web forward. They decided that they would argue about which format was better, RSS or Adam. <laughs> and they fought and fought and fought using mostly mailing lists and sometimes in person. And the fight kind of still goes on today if you mention microformats to day one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, a, it's a difficult thing because all of these really smart people got distracted by semantics, by this, this kind of work. And in reality, nobody needs to know even what RSS and Adam is. It doesn't matter. It's just a thing, right? But during this time, the rise of social networks happened because a lot of people ended up saying, well, I'm just going to join a service or work for a company like Friends for Facebook, MySpace, or Twitter, instead of continuing to participate in this war. And what these websites had done that was different from the personal website movement was they put RSS embedded into the social profile. So you could go on Facebook and be automatically subscribed to all your friends' updates and details without having to have a RSS reader over here. It merged them together, and it was one click sign up, and you don't have to run your own server. And so these allowed this group of websites to expand 
and allow everybody to use them. But it also activates people's ability to own their own data and control their own site and run their own domain. So this was what happened, this was this big thing, and that wasn't what was supposed to happen. Um, we kind of saw the developments of what this would look like, what a single UI subscription model would look like on the independent web, on people's personal websites, with things like Pingback. And the idea with Pingback was originally a very nice idea, a way to let somebody know that you've linked to their site. However, this didn't work out so well because this was machine generated. So you can see, if you've ever run a WordPress site, that there are lots and lots of pingbacks and trackbacks in that you get stuck into your site. Because it didn't end up being very useful at all. Um, it's just a dot, 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 excerpt, URL, date, dot, dot, dot. It's not, it's not human readable. And so one of the internet principles is human readable first. Humans first, then machines. Something that you make should be readable by humans as well as computers so that it keeps going forward over time instead of installed on it. And this is track back display. It's just, it's, it's nothing, it just turns into spam. Um, and so, personal sites started declining for all these different reasons, right? Started by the RSS Atom Wars, people were just going to social networks for blogging, and then blogging ended up taking a long time. RSS and Atom started to fade away, people still use it, but with uh, Google Reader, that was really the nail in the coffin of that, and shut down. Um, so, blogs, people do blog today, a lot of people find it really annoying. Uh, WordPress is dominant. I think it's the sixth of the world. Um, and people are starting to host their blogs on GitHub or Medium or you know, they just link to it from high revenues. And so they're not even owning their own blog content. Uh, the terms of service of some of these sites, which I'll show later, is not very friendly to independent contributors either. Um, and people often want to blog, but there's so much more on the web to actually consume, or you know, some of your own memories. This is this is Sarah in, in this distraction uh, of all these different memories that she has in her room in this in this big junk heap of memories. I think of the internet like this a lot. I want to blog, but then I get distracted by all this junk, all this information <laughs> junk food. And unlike your stomach, which tells you when it's full, your brain doesn't tell you when it's full on the internet. You can just keep you know, having all this information jump through. And when you're on a social network, that's really what you see. If you blog to Facebook, it's, you know, here's an interesting article that I didn't write, but I'm sharing with somebody. Here's another interesting article that I didn't write, but I'm sharing with somebody. And you get distracted, 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 distracted. And the article that you might have wanted to write, you never end up writing. So you end up in this kind of, uh, Lisa Reichelt calls it continuous partial attention, where you never really pay full attention to something. You never fully get something done. You never have this, this uh, unfragmentation. So to counter this, I started making my own personal private WordPress website that I could log into, and so my entire version of the internet would be only the content that I created. This felt really, really good. So the other issue is that you kind of have these terms of service that don't really help people out at all. So Medium used to have the right to use Medium and content for any purpose, even if they got acquired in the future. Um, I went to the Medium headquarters and I told them that, and they said, well, we removed that. I said, great. Um, but Wikia, the communities don't really own their content, and they can't really transfer it off the site. And I don't know if this has changed by now, but I know that somebody left their company, left working at their company after seeing all these different groups that had added all their content to basically an ad sponsored Wikipedia and then couldn't get their content off and then wanted to move their community elsewhere. So we're not even talking about individuals at this point, but communities of a thousand people who have created their own voluntary content, haven't gotten paid for it, it's been monetized with advertising, and then they can't take it off the site. So let's go back to 2003. So what should have happened in 2003? Personal blogs would have moved forward, and they would have looked a lot more like you log into your site, you see status updates from people that you're following out there in the open web, and you get notifications if somebody liked your content. Um, so we need a way to pick up from, from where this left off, to own our own data, and to own it first and post it to other websites. And we just need to be implementing things, and not worry about what it looks like. So here's an example of uh, Blaine Cook and, and, and Ralph. They stayed up all night and they said, we're going to do this thing where you use Jaifu and you use Twitter. 
but we shouldn't have to rely on using these services, and we shouldn't have to put, you know, if you sign up for one thing, and this guy signs up for another thing, you shouldn't have to care what somebody signs up for. You should be able to communicate with all these different silos. The, the other analogy is that, could you imagine if I sign up for an email account through Hotmail, and somebody else had signed up through an email account on Gmail, and we couldn't email each other because we both signed up on a different email account? Email interoperates. Email doesn't care what provider you sign up for. It allows you to communicate no matter what it is, a Hotmail or Gmail or whatever account you use, or your own personal email account. It should be the same with social network silos. If I say something on Facebook, and I send it out to a bunch of different social networks, I should be able to get responses back from people that are subscribed to me, regardless of what network they're on. And this would have been what would have happened with personal websites if this had gone forward. You would have been able to say something on your website, post it out to other social networks, get the responses from those social networks, have them posted back to your site, and not only own the data first, but also all the comments and have those be attached. Instead of having to search on Twitter for some historical comment history that you had, so that if Twitter goes away or Facebook goes away, you still have all of that content, you still have all of those reactions. So that's what these guys implemented. They said, they, they implemented part of that. So I'm going to send you a message from Twitter, and then that guy would get it on Jaiku, and that guy would send a message back from Jaiku, and then the other guy would respond or get the response on Twitter. So interoperation. It was super advanced at the time. Um, a bunch of people got together, uh, frustrated about these ideas, and they said, we're going to make this thing called the Federated Social Web Summit, and it was in Portland, Oregon. All those interesting people showed up, the guys from the diaspora showed up, we had people from, uh, we had uh, Chris Messina, the guy who made the hashtag, um, we had all these interesting people, but people were extremely serious. The whole tone of it was, we need to make this important thing that's going to take over Facebook. I mean, not that overt, but it was, it was very serious, and as you can see, you know, everybody's just really focused, and it was really frustrating for people who just wanted to build. The whole thing was about talk. There wasn't any contribution. There wasn't any doing anything. People said that it sounded more like a W3C committee and an eight-hour phone call lecture okay. than actually getting something done. So Tom Tegchelik, uh, who started microformats with, um, with Kevin Marks, and, and Aaron Brecky, who runs it off on that, sat down afterwards, and um, and they said, we're really, really, really frustrated about this. Man, we have to do something. And basically, this is a really important concept to be wary of masquerades. There are a lot of conferences or groups of people that will sit down and they'll look nice and they'll talk and they won't get anything done. And people can get sucked into that for five or ten years and nothing ever comes out of it. You can be on a billion mailing list and never get anything done, or you can sit down and actually do something. Um, so Tom Terry and Aaron sat down and they said, look, this conference really annoyed us, nothing got done, let's make an indie web just just launch it off and just get something done. So we made this thing called the Webcamp, and it had some rules. We wanted to prevent people from showing up that didn't build things. Um, so we made a silly rule. We said, you have to show stuff, and you can't talk about it. So you know, if, if you have some idea for wireframes, don't say, I have an idea for wireframes. What if x, y, and z? Show the physical wireframes, because in doing the drawing of the wireframes, you figure out all the edge cases that you can think of. Um, or, hey, I have this idea for X, where this site could communicate with this other site. Okay, build it and show it, right? So it was, it was this kind of issue. And then the only thing that we required was you had to have your own domain name to attend. And that, a bunch of people said, well, I'm not getting my own domain name. And so we said, okay. And that was it. And it was kind of brutal in a way, but on the other hand, it filtered out a bunch of people who would have just redone the federated social or something. Um, and the other issue was that we didn't want to have any mailing lists. How do we structure this group so that it works, so that people actually communicate with each other and they don't get lost in this maze of randomness? Um, so we decided no mailing lists, uh, and instead we used IRC. And you know, when you send an email to somebody and it's 11 p.m., and maybe you're slightly annoyed, maybe it's not time based, send an email to the court. Sit there and say, okay, well, you really need to respond to this thing and then you try to respond to it, and then you get tired, and then maybe you're cranky, and anyway, and, and then somebody else responds to it, and you take that personally, and then, you know, this is, this is how the RSS and Adam wars really happen. You know? People sending emails to each other. Um, this is an example from one of those email systems. 
Here's, here's the issue. Giant negative headline. Tons and tons of negative stuff. This is pointless, right? Giant header content, and finally, at the very bottom, you get a message, right? And you see one of these every time you get a message from this builder. So, hey, probably should not have been taking a drink when I read this last sentence, because he took offense to something and somebody said, you do know that we're talking about the syndication period. What does this even mean? Does it even matter? Knowing this, like, you know, sometimes if you have good community managers, they can work really well. Um, so we switch over to IRC. If you look at the density of what's going on right now in real time of people that are working across completely different boundaries and time zones, this is just really dense. Like, what will happen is there'll be a wiki and then there'll be an IRC. So we'll come up with something, and the minute it gets half baked enough, somebody will make a wiki page for it and we'll start to fill it out so that the, the information gets better over time instead of worse. So you don't have people nitpicking somebody's email and taking it apart, but you have people building on the ideas that somebody has had. And so overall, it gets really, really positive. So just shifting that allowed a bunch of people in different countries to communicate, collaborate with each other, and build things over time. Um, we also have a little bot in there. So if somebody's not in the channel, you can say, tell this person, and blah, 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 blah. And when they get back into the channel, they'll get hit with that message. And so even if you're trying to communicate with somebody across the time zone, and they're asleep, you can still communicate with them. It's not real time, but it, it feels better than sending emails and then having to check emails. So what, how, can you, how can you participate in input? I guess, here's some principles. Um, so the first one that's really important is called process. This is one of the important principles. You post on your own website and you syndicate it elsewhere. So you post where you own it first on your own domain. And then you use your domain to send a message out to the website that you want to send it to. You can choose that at the point of publishing. So this is, this is basically, um, you use the silos as a way to get your data out to a lot of different people, but you still own that data. And I can actually show you that on the site. So. Okay, so here's my site, and this is running peak P3K, which is um, something that Aaron built. So there's a bunch of different people in the IndieWeb community that have made their own frameworks to do this. So what I do here is I go down to the bottom of the page, and what I would um, normally do is I'd log in with my domain name. So I'm going to log in with my own domain using India Auth. And then I can use any of these providers to verify my identity. So let's just get up. Now I'm logged into my own site. Now I go to my admin interface, and I can set a note. So type this in here, there's a tweet preview, and this will just post to my site, but I can also optionally syndicate it out to Twitter or Facebook or GitHub or Indie News if I want or I could RSVP to a specific event. So if somebody like Aaron had an IndieWeb Camp breakfast event, I could put the event URL in here and RSVP to it. And my RSVP would show up on his site as I'm going to this event without having to use Facebook. Um, but if he also made an event on Facebook, I could RSVP through my site to that Facebook event too um, without having to touch Facebook at all. So in this case, I'm just going to syndicate this to Twitter. So it shows up on my site here. Here's a firm link. And, and it should show up here in a moment. <laughs> it's in tweets and replies. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know what? It's sort of I really hate the See? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I can't even get to the. <laughs> Yay! Okay, this is why I'm so happy that I can post my own site now. Okay, um, so here is my tweet, only, but there's also a link back to my original tweet that's posted on my site with a short URL. So I click on that, and I go right back here. So that's that. 
Now, if somebody replies to this tweet on Twitter, that reply will also show up on my site from Twitter. And if I syndicate it out to Facebook and Twitter, anytime somebody likes or comments on that on Twitter or Facebook, it will also show up on my site as well. This is tremendously free because you can get all of that data back on your site. Let me see if I can try and find it. I just replied to you. Hey, cool. <laughs> so there's a little cron job running, but we can probably. There's a delay with bridging. Yeah, it's a bridging delay. So this, this is using a thing called bridging, which you can sign up for. Um, and bridging is, it allows you to, it's basically the thing in the back end that monitors people responding to you and then goes back. I think it's on like a five minute delay. I should show one for this is mostly Instagram, looks like. Well, I can just show you an Instagram one. So what about I take a bunch of photos and I want them to show up on my site. So I'm gonna take a picture right now through and post on Instagram. Sure. Okay, not. <laughs> see, badge check, badge check. Ask first, yeah. can I take a picture? Okay. And then, no. So, perfect. Okay. Everyone say anywhere. Anywhere. Oops. Oops. <laughs> Wait, what was it? Okay. Wait. Wait. You said hi, everyone say. Okay. So, I'm just going to post this here. So there we go. Now it's on my site. As well as Instagram. Ding. <laughs> okay, so what is that? That is not Posse. That's another thing called Pesos. Now, Pesos is when you can't post to your site first and then post to another service. It's the opposite. So it's I'm using Instagram as a publishing system. I'm going to publish to Instagram first, and then I'm going to send that photo to my site. Right? So you publish elsewhere and then syndicate back to your own site versus versus Posse, where you post your own site first and then syndicate elsewhere. So this is kind of a band-aid for what you can't do. You still get the data, but you get it later. So I just did that demo. Probably go back to um, the site to see if. Ah, here we go. All right. So these are. See how it is. Hey, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so this will continue on forever. Oh, how did it? How did it know my domain? Uh, let's see. Twitter bio. Like in your site? Yeah, my through, reply, yeah through, your, through your your bio on Twitter. Okay. Here. Okay. Yeah. There you go. And it grabs your, um, your face from Twitter. It's <laughs> 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 your face. Now we grab the site. Oh, here we go. And then he posted a comment from his site. And this is a comment. So this is what Ben's site looks like. So he has his own publishing interface called GNOME, which you can actually use right now. Um, and that's what he's working on. But he was able to just reply to my post right through his website, and then it would show up on my website too. So if I reply to him. So is he doing? Know something I can do a Twitter follow on his site to follow you. Uh, he is he has set up a way to respond to any URL on the web, and that kind of excerpt will show up get copied to his site as well as well as the comment. So right now I'm actually replying to his comment on his site. This is the URL. I have this little shortcut here, and then the text. Hey, thanks for the reply. 
And so I'm wondering how he knew you to do it. Was oh. that on his site too, or was that? Uh, he else? knew that I tweeted because everybody is in the IRC channel in the web camp. And anytime somebody mentions the Indie Web hashtag, it goes into IRC chat. Okay. <laughs> it goes into IRC chat. Not my tweet, but ooh, I have to reply to it because whenever you see a, a live tweet go out and you're doing a demo, then people will reply to it from their own sites. So that's uh... So I replied, I said, hey, thanks for the reply. And then it should, I reply should show up on this site. There we go. So this is an example of where we did site-to-site -site reply without a social network, but it worked just like a social network. And we didn't need any intermediary at all. Right now, the stopover is, while the silos are still here, you use something like Pesos or Posse to interoperate with the social networks on the web that you use. But eventually, if all the social networks go away at some point, you should be able to use the web without having to use the social networks. So is there... So you said the hashtag went into IRC, was that via Twitter or via your like RSS or something alike on uh, your site? It's uh, it's via a bot that goes out and scrapes the web and free <laughs> So so from his website, can he subscribe to your updates? Uh, so that's that's a thing. Right now we're trying to work on following. And that's that's a good question because right now you can't really do that very much. But there's this thing we're doing this weekend called the Indie Webcam on Saturday and Sunday where one of the sessions will probably be in that. Um, we have made a hacked RSS reader that you can subscribe to people's any websites in. Um, I don't have it on this machine. Um, but yeah, the idea is that you should be able to at some point follow from your own website. Or so that's like one of the next steps. It's, it's slightly more advanced than what we've made right now, so we'll probably do a session on that this weekend. And there are a lot of people who ask that. They say, I want to follow these people. Um, so here's the Indie Web Camp channel. And then if somebody tweets from the Indie Web hashtag, it'll automatically go up here. And there's tons of people in here from all the this is where we get a lot of stuff done when we're not meeting up. So that was an example of web mention. Um, you can mention somebody from your own website, and then they should be able to receive it. So um, I was able to mention uh, Ben in my comment in response to him, and it will show up on his website. So Sandy Buchetti created this. So this takes care of the pingback display that's really inhuman and difficult to read. And it turns it into one mention display, which works very much on social, social networks. I can have an entire communication on my site with somebody else, and they can see it, provided I mention it. So that's what that looks like on my website. I can post a note, have it show up. It shows up simultaneously on Twitter and on my website, so we'll get a ping on both Twitter and the site. Um, and then that's what it looks like on this website. So I just show that. So, as you mentioned before, the big problem with pingbacks and trackbacks was the spamming effort. How, what's, what's to stop that from happening here? Is there any? Well, right now it's just really hard to set this up. So, <laughs> 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 um, you have to have your own domain name and things like that. Um, there are some interesting ways of blocking that. So, for instance, I had a wiki for a while that you could edit provided I was following you on Twitter, right? There's no spam, right? Unless somebody's Twitter account gets hacked and then they know I have a wiki and then they're a nerd and they want to like edit a bunch of stuff into my wiki, which is going to be rare with all of the people that I follow that have lots of alpha and numeric passwords um, that change all the time. But that's the kind of thing of, hey, let's set up different authentication and, and different spam systems where it's a, it's a social basis, right? Somebody can only do something if I'm following them. Only if we have a certain point I was just wondering if you had anything like that implemented yeah. now. Or... We don't have anything like that implemented now, except for that, that wiki that I have. Um, so that's another thing that we will be discussing. Um, what we're doing right now is just trying to get something in place and build it and have a community work on it. And mm -hmm. then when we get to those points, each of those chain points, then we solve those problems that we have. We have it in mind, but we don't want to prematurely scale up some anti-spam thing when there aren't hundreds of thousands of people in the community 
that. But it's on our minds, and we're trying to think of more clever ways of doing it than like the WordPress way, where you just get tons and tons of stuff. <laughs> but a really, really important new question. Um, this is an example of an indie web event RSVP. So we have an indie web camp breakfast. Um, we're going to have one on Thursday at oh geez, Thursday's tomorrow. We're going to have one tomorrow morning at Tilt um, at 7:30 in the morning. So we'll have actually some events posted to our various sites and we'll tweet them out. And if you have the setup on your site, you can actually RSVP to those and they'll show up on the site. Um, we've been able to make uh, Facebook entries and RSVP to the Facebook event through your own site and vice versa. So that's been really freeing so that you get a copy of that on your site as well. So why do we need an Indie Web? I've tried to explain some of the things before, but I think Mostly, there, there are a number of reasons why people, it's not really joining an Indie Web, it's just using these principles on your own website however way you want to. But one is that you're afraid of losing all your files. At some point, some social network or some site is not going to have a copy of your files anymore, and you're going to be out. So you need to have a local copy of those. Um, if you have your entire business on a social network, and suddenly the social network says, you're a violation of the terms of service, and we're going to shut you down. Say you had a giant Etsy site, for instance, and you were making your entire living off of that, and then it got shut down. If you don't also have it running on your site, and you don't have that inventory, you're out, right? A lot of people make their money off of their social profiles at this point. It's really important to have a backup copy. Um, if a company gets acquired and your data is taken away, or you're locked out of it, um, silos simply profiting off of all of your data. You don't like the issues of surveillance and privacy, and you want to run your own website. Another reason. And for me, it's the ability to create again. I had been stuck on this web that I was consuming versus creating, and I was just giving all my data to somebody else, and I wasn't building the infrastructure that I could play with. There was no playground, there was no sandbox, I couldn't learn anything. My ability to develop had just stuttered. And so going through that active being like, okay, I'm going to register to me, and then, then I have to do SSL off. And then I'm going to install some WordPress things and crazy plugins and oh, that only took like three days. Okay, that's not bad. Now I own that. Like I can sleep well at night knowing that I own my own data, it's private, and I can post all the stuff that I wouldn't normally post on the web because I control, I control it. I control that user interface. I don't like it, I can change it. It's tremendously free and it's very nuanced. It's something that we don't have as much on the web anymore. Um, basically, so I, I do a freedom mostly. Um, to decide what content you want to publish and who sees it. Um, better user experience, it's not going to just change on you. And you can host this content on your site forever as long as you want. And have that data over generations and generations of the web, which can happen every two years. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully, as, as Jareth, I don't advocate getting out of the lab. Um, but, um, but if you get out of the lab, you can have a phone and also, all these social networks, you have to sign in in order to see all these links a lot of the time, especially on Facebook. All of these, you know, there's no permalinks for a lot of the stuff that's, that's indexable. So, having posts on it with web gives the web back its interconnectivity and its richness that just isn't there anymore. So, what have we built as a community? Well, we built a lot of open source components, there's a lot of different projects. If you go to IndieWebCamp.com slash projects, there's a bunch of stuff that you can play with and download. If you just want to uh, work on this with WordPress, you can download WordPress and get it to work so that you can write a post and automatically send that post to Facebook and Twitter. Um, and then all the comments from that post come back and go to your site. Um, that way, you don't have to actually implement a commenting system. Um, you just set this up, and then you don't get all that comment spam either, which is quite nice. So we have all these different things. I think of it like generations. We have people who want to develop their own content management systems from scratch. We call that generation one because they have a lot of enjoyment uh, towards complexity. And then journalists and bloggers are the next group that we found. They really don't want to build their own content management systems, but they can run their own domain and install, web, like, install WordPress and install a plugin. So a lot of journalists have taken this. The next generation is People who have personal domains, but they're managed by things like Tumblr. And then the fourth generation is people who've never had their own web domain, and they've only used social networks their entire life. They've never developed anything. We want to make 
this software and these principles available to everybody all the way down the chain, but we have to start somewhere. And so right now we're in generation one, half of generation two. So Indie Web Camp this weekend will be simultaneously in Portland and also at the New York Times um, because there's a lot of people in journalism that are interested in doing this on their own websites, uh, especially Dan Gilmore, writes for Slate. Um, so he wrote about this, he said, uh, you know, on Slate, he set this up, he said, hey, Indie Web Movement is interesting, but then on his own personal website, he wrote a whole web, uh, he wrote a whole post about this, and people commented, and the comments showed up from other services and were rendered in, in, in his website, and it was really exciting. And he set this up in about four hours at Indie Web Camp in San Francisco uh, a few months ago. And it was really exciting. Um, so that's really how you can get out of the labyrinth. You can own your data, own your identity. Um, first, if you don't have one, you should probably get a domain name at some point. If you want to uh, learn more, you can follow us on Indie Camp or on Twitter, uh, or sorry, on IRC, um, and just ask questions. A ton of people on the channel almost any hour of the night, and they're really friendly. And come to Indie Camp this weekend. Like, if you need your own domain name to attend, and you need to have uh, Indie Off. It's really simple to do. You just follow the site instructions. Basically, you have a yeah. Well, I won't go through that right now. So, what if we don't do this? Um, <laughs> 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 I don't even want to go into that, but um, we'll all be stuck in the labyrinth forever. Um, we will not own our data. We will not own our identity. We will have uncertainty in the user experience. And we will never learn how to make our own things. And if that's okay with you, that's okay with you, but you are beholden to the unpredictability of this ever shifting labyrinth in place that is social networks that aren't made by you. So be careful. And know, at the very least, after this time, that you are in a labyrinth when you use social networks. And finally, tell the silos that you have no power over. <laughs> So, time is up. Um, thank you very much. So, what things do you need most? What things do we need most? Um, let's see. More people to contribute, I suppose. But we need more little tools, I guess. Well, Aaron, what do you think? What, what, what do we need? I, what do we need? What do what does who need? Uh, the daily web. <laughs> we need, like, what we kind need, of modules or? We need you things. to have an interest in owning your own identity and working on your tools. Right. And a lot of people are building tools that can be reused but, uh, by other people on small components. But it's really about individual people just having an interest in supporting it so that it can grow and don't just default to using Facebook. The best thing to do is to look um, on the wiki and see all the holes and the stuff that people are like, oh, I really want to work on this, but I don't have enough time. Or, you know, and, and build in the smallest Lego blocks that you can so that it's reusable by everybody in the plan But then, you know, don't it that if you like Python, for instance, and make a bunch of stuff in Python so that all languages aren't very good. Um, I'm wondering about things, especially like with the RSVP and event. Uh, integration with other social networks around privacy, like people's decision to attend, attend an event isn't necessarily something that they want on the public internet, <coughs> but within Facebook it's kind of locked down with some ACLs, sort of. Um, so is that being taken into account by the RSVP thing? Is that something you're worrying about? Is that That's, um, with private posts in general, it's kind of a problem with any sort of private posts, not just RSVPs, but um, there's been some people experimenting with that where, um, yeah, you have to sign into somebody's site to see extra content like an RSVP or a post, private message. Um, it tends to be something that isn't a huge, a high priority for a lot of people right now because there's so many other issues to work out with just the public side at the moment. But it's definitely an interest but for a lot of people. So as soon as, basically the way this works is as soon as somebody is just itching to, to solve this for themselves, then they'll make something work. And then everybody will be like, oh, that's awesome. And then like help out and jump in and do it themselves. 
So I expect that um, we'll see a lot more private posts in the next year or so because we've got so much of the public side working at this point. Yeah, matching, matching up the, the privacy is really, really important so that your privacy settings on Facebook are matched with how it works in the US. One more question? Um, so, are there any web principles that kind of larger providers can use? So, say you're running like a platform or something, like what can you do to actually do you know, either, <laughs> yeah, obviously providing access to data, but are there things where <coughs> those larger companies can do it to making this easier? Yeah. Um, There's a URL for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a URL for that. I, I think it's um, inuitcamp.com slash friendly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Slash friendly. Um, we were talking about this at Medium, so I gave a talk at Medium headquarters, and some of the people there were like, oh, wow, we should probably implement some of these things. <laughs> right, so that, um, so that, you can, for instance, own your data after or, or get responses from different systems. Actually, it would be really valuable for a company like Medium to allow you to post you know, from Medium to all of these different websites and have all that content come back to you. Um, there's, there's actually a lot more opportunity for the websites to work together. Um, so yeah, so slash friendly. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of little things out there that would be really useful that, that yeah, can't go into right now, but I'm sure. Much time. All right, everybody, thank you, and uh, please give Amber Kitchen applause. <laughs>